Before we get started with our webinar, I just want to give you a little bit of a tour of our features. You can see on your webinar platform that we have multiple chat pods. Uh, these will allow you to communicate with the presenters as well as address any technical issues you might have. Over, um, You can type your message or question in the narrow box at the bottom and then either hit enter or the, um, chat pop, the chat box and that should submit the message. And there are three different chat pods. The first is the technical assistance chat pod. If you're having any technical issues with sound or if you need more information, please post your questions there and one of our technical staff will be able to help you. We also have a questions chat pod. I see uh, people sharing their locations and names, so we welcome those who have maybe joined us a little bit later to also enter their information. And then finally, we have a, a box for questions where you can post your questions for presenters and our moderator, Mindy O'Cummings, and we'll be happy to make sure that we address questions as much as we can during this webinar. And now I'd like to introduce our moderator for this afternoon, Dr. Mindy O'Cummings. Dr. O'Cummings is a principal researcher at AIR and is a researcher on the Dropout Prevention Research Alliance for Vell Midwest. Uh, Dr. O'Cummings has worked in the field of education for more than 18 years. Her experiences include teaching in special and general education settings, serving as an elementary and middle school vice principal, <coughs> conducting research and program evaluations, providing technical assistance to educators, researchers, and developers, and working with student families. In all of these positions, Dr. O'Cummings has been able to blend her professional expertise with her personal passion of preventing students from dropping out of school and promoting college and career preparedness through advancing and promoting database decision-making tools and processes for states, districts, and schools. Now I'll turn over the webinar to Dr. O'Cummings, who can tell us more about today's presentation. Great. Thanks, Emily. I'm excited to um, jump into the webinar. Today we want to really talk about and increase awareness of the EWS kind of development and implementation across the country, and then really dive into what that looks like in our region in the Midwest and how things are going. Through these conversations, we'd like to provide relevant and practical guidance to other states who are interested in implementing early warning systems and specifically get into how they can effectively support the use of early warning systems in schools and districts. And lastly, we want to engage education stakeholders in a conversation about those challenges, successes, and the importance of state involvement with early warning system development and implementation. So I think we have both a power packed, but also a very full agenda. Um, we are going to start out with um, Susan Terrio, who's going to talk a little bit about the landscape of early warning systems, so give us a national perspective. And then we're going to jump in and look at two state perspectives, both Wisconsin and Minnesota, Jared Knowles and John Gimple. This will be followed by really practical kind of lessons learned from implementation, the school um, perspective, and that's going to be Timothy um, Convoy. And lastly, we've reserved some time for questions and answers. So we definitely look forward to engaging in a discussion with you, our participants. So without um, any further delay, I would like to introduce you to Susan Terrio. Um, Dr. Terrio is also a principal researcher here at the American Institutes for Research and leads our organization's um, college and career readiness efforts. Um, for over 18 years, she's led and conducted research that focuses on state and federal um, education efforts to build the capacity of high-needs districts and schools. As a researcher, Dr. Terrio's experience is, um, is examining the state and district role in supporting and turning around low-performing schools. She emphasizes the design and implementation of research plans that answer critical policy research questions in order to improve policy implementation and outcomes. She's been very instrumental in designing and um, a process of looking at early warning systems and working directly with numerous states, districts, and schools around the country. So I'm very excited to turn it over to Dr. Terrio. Thank you, Mindy. Um, I first want to say it's really a great honor to be presenting with you and the others who um, have developed and supported implementation. Sadly, I haven't met some of you in the past, but I've been hearing your name for many years, so it's very exciting um, to hear about your work. Um, 
and I know that we'll all benefit from the range of perspectives today. So thanks so much. Um, so today I'm going to talk about the landscape of early warning systems um, throughout the country and share with you a way of organizing and thinking through the concept of early warning systems. Um, in addition, I'm hoping to share some strategies states that we've worked with have used to support and encourage implementation. Um, so first, I'm trying to control this and it's not quite working for me. Um, hold on. Thank you. So first, um, I want to talk about early warning systems in general. Um, we know that um, more than 35 states, according to the data quality campaign, um, have indicated that they provide some kind of early warning system data to the districts and schools, um, to their own districts and schools. And we know it's expanding. And at least last year, last I checked, at least three governors actually mentioned the concept of early warning systems in their state of the state addresses. So we know this is a really growing area. Um, we also know that early warning systems rely on data, of which state education agencies and districts have an abundance these days. Um, and many states have found that um, this is a place where they can offer an added, um, a value-added opportunity um, and provide support to districts and schools by providing this type of early warning system data. Um, but I think it's important because early warning systems is a very generic term in many ways. And um, in working with states across the country and districts, I started to realize that there are some differences in what they mean. And so, um, based on observations and working with individuals, we developed um, an early warning system implementation pathway. And the idea is that this allows us to focus in uh, more, more closely on what it is exactly you want to do and understand kind of where you're fitting in in the process as you move forward. So yeah, can you go to the next slide? So the input, click again. Thank you. Um, so basically, we, we start with synthesizing research. There's validating indicators. We've all heard of the early warning system indicators. Um, and then there's also, keep, can you keep clicking? I'm sorry. <laughs> Customizing and developing tools and support. And then again, launching and implementing early warning systems, which is a key challenge, especially at the state level. Assessing and improving processes. And then finally, bringing it all together <clears throat> um, and coming back up and kind of synthesizing, so a continuous improvement type of model. Today, we're primarily going to focus on the middle three and talk about some of the work that's been done um, in states in these three areas. Um, so first, I want to talk about some of the state early warning system implementation challenges. So states that are considering um, developing early warning systems face many common challenges. And these are just a couple themes that, um, that I've taken away um, from the work across the country. Um, one is local control. So what does that mean? It means that you know, if they provide these early warning system data, they can't necessarily make them use the information. Um, and there's you know, different styles and ways of doing it. There's tools involved. There's guidance. There are actual indicators and validated indicators. So it can, it can be very challenging. Um, the other is the state and local education agency capacity to use data and support um, in their school. So um, what I mean by that is that when, it's, when it's sitting in a state education agency, you may have your own strengths and weaknesses and where you can add value um, when you're thinking about early warning systems. Um, but the same goes for the schools and districts with whom, you, with whom the state oversee, uh, works. And these state schools and districts have a great variation. Um, and we've actually experienced this. So we've worked with states in trying to roll out early warning system um, types of activities. So maybe basically looking at attendance, for example. And we'll work with one school that doesn't have the ability to look at attendance across the whole school. There's different ways of collecting that data. And um, it's not provided to the teachers. So they're not able to actually look at that kind of information. But then there's other schools that have very sophisticated understandings of student data and can really use these data quite easily. Um, the other is availability and allocation of resources. So the 
what this means is how are you going to use money, time, and people? Um, because early warning systems and the implementation of early warning systems really takes all of these things put together. They, um, first in terms of funding, um, the state can, there are cheaper ways, and we'll talk about those um, in a moment, that states can kind of consider um, trying, to, trying to engage schools and districts, but funding really makes a difference. How can you leverage change? Um, and a funding stream is always one key way to do that. In addition, it's going to take time. So it's going to take time on behalf of the, of the state to actually be shepherding and providing support over the course of um, implementation, as well as district and um, school, le school level staff time to start to look at these data. So the time needs to be set aside to look at the data, start to become familiar with data use, early warning systems, and start to really use this data to take action. That takes time. It also can take, some, take people. Um, frequently, we've observed that it's adding on a role to an existing committee or team, um, or they've designated this to an individual who really provides data and helps facilitate these sessions. But it really does take some, some time of some people in these schools to actually use. And then the last um, challenge is that dropout prevention is either not a state or district priority. And um, sometimes it's a state priority, but not the district priority. Um, maybe they don't feel they have a dropout problem, for example. And then sometimes it's a real issue for a particular district, but not seen as a state priority. So the, that misalignment can be somewhat challenging. So what are the, so I first want to talk about validating indicators. And if you remember um, the pathways piece that I went over um, just a moment ago, the first step was synthesizing the research. And you know, for the most part, many organizations, such as the, um, the, re the regional education laboratories, as well as other federally funded content centers, have done a lot of work to synthesize the research. And I really believe there's some nice compendiums of research on early warning system indicators that are out there um, and digestible to the public. So we quickly get to this point of, well, all right, what about validating indicators? So what does it mean to validate indicators? Um, basically, it's, these indicators are used to identify students who are at risk of not graduating from high school. And it relies, there's many different models for validating indicators. Um, some are very basic. Some can be looking at attendance. And you can see, for example, within, let's say, the first 20 days of ninth grade, students who miss 10% or more of school days are, um, or 20% more of school days are far more likely to drop out than those who do not. So if you start to look at those types, you can look at those type of data at the school level, or you can look at bigger types of models that are, um, that integrate lots of different data, including attendance, course performance, performance on, performance on state assessments, um, and other factors and data that are collected at the state level. So wh what are the benefits of validating indicators? First, um, the benefit is that they're based on available data that is ap applicable to the state context. So the data are very meaningful to the schools and districts in your state. So for example, if you have a particular assessment in your state, you could use that data. And it's much more meaningful for the context of um, your particular state to the, your particular schools and districts. Because they understand it, it's data that they're readily using and that's readily available. Um, the other thing about validating your own indicators within your state is that it really does increase the legitimacy of the indicators if they're validated based on data on, school, on students in your schools within the state. So that's a really big deal to some people, um, even though some, you know, there are some consistent thresholds that you can look at across some general thresholds and guidance about indicators that you can use. But starting to focus on, focus in and use state data can be really important. And then um, the other the other benefit of validating indicators is that the indicators themselves are really reflections of state-determined priorities and outcomes. So for example, um, 
in Massachusetts, they had done some work and wanted to develop a system that was more comprehensive, that wasn't just focusing on high school graduation, but was focusing on key milestones that lead to high school graduation, such as reading by the end of third grade. And so they developed early warning system indicators to identify students as early as first grade and second grade who may be off track for meeting that milestone, milestone being able or being able to um, read by the end of third grade. So using, validating your own indicators allows you to shape your own model and identify the key, and this model can reflect the priorities within your state. But there's still some challenges to this. <clears throat> um, some of the challenges for validating indicators, and they're not small necessarily, um, one is Validating um, indicators takes time and intensive resources. Um, so to develop a model, it can take a substantial amount of time to make, if you're being thoughtful about it, and making key decisions about what should go into this model to identify students who are at risk. Secondly, validation is ongoing. Um, as we all know, the data that we, when we're about to have another change, but the data collected in states changes. The assessments we use change over time. So the types and sources of data that are informing these, um, informing these models that are identifying students as at risk or not at risk are actually changing. So accommodations need to be made on a regular basis. Um, also, as we all know, there are limitations to the data elements that are collected. Um, things like behavior, for example, can be very, can be data that are reported um, very differently across schools. So there's some limitations um, to the actual data elements that are available. There may be ways and ideas we have about what would be more predictive of risk, but they're just data that aren't collected, and it would be unreasonable to potentially collect those. The other really important um, challenge to validating indicators is that um, when you're developing a model, you're looking at data from the past. Um, but, if you, but the idea is that you'll be applying this model to data, um, current data. So you have to know when those data are available. So for example, if you want to ensure that um, schools and districts are receiving information about each of their students' risk levels in August, and you use, for example, your state assessment as part of your model, but it's not available till October, you have a timing issue. So you have to, you have to think about and weigh um, how important it is to include certain data elements and when those data are actually available. And then last, um, in order to be sharing this information, you really need some kind of system to share the early warning system indicator data with districts and schools. Um, I've seen, School, um, I've seen states that have just provided Excel spreadsheets with the information um, in it, but it's, it is quite helpful to be able to parse the data and to look at it in different ways. And I've seen some other examples where they have systems in which you can get these data and manipulate the way you look at it um, in terms of reports, et cetera. So that's a really important consideration if you're considering validating indicators. Um, and so, First, you have to decide whether you're going to validate indicators or not. I just um, went through the benefits and challenges. Um, there are also um, accepted early warning system indicators. If you're choosing not to validate indicators right away, you can um, move right into launch and implementation by using these kind of nationally accepted thresholds. Um, so now we move on to launching and implementing. So, um, states that have decided to use nationally accepted thresholds, states that have validated indicators, all of them have faced this challenge of how to launch and implement an early warning system. Um, and there's many strategies to, and, and local control, don't forget, is a challenge. So they're really looking for ways to engage and support implementation in schools and districts with a wide range of skills and expertise wide ranges of interest and you know, differences in the degree to which they're prioritizing um, improving high school graduation rates. So given that, um, one general approach that I've seen is the idea of pro providing technical assistance and support to schools and districts. So um, how this plays out is that states will provide um, information, um, guidance on the website, 
Um, things like the nas nationally developed early warning system tools or locally developed early warning system tools. I've even seen examples of local work and resources that districts and schools within this state have developed and share across um, for other schools. Um, in addition, there's some implementation guidance. Um, the National Center, National High School Center developed some implementation guidance. I've seen that on many state websites as a guide to walk schools and districts through the process of using early warning system data. In addition, I've seen states that have developed their own guidance, um, which often looks similar, but you know, has some local context um, and has been customized for the local context. Um, in addition to the so basically, the, can we just go back one slide? Sorry. Um, so basically, how the, the thing with technical assistance is support, that the strength of it is, it's really it's minimal in cost. You can provide training to, to schools and districts, but it's primarily focused on guidance and um, information and tools that can actually support this. And then, um, and the problem or challenge with it is, is that the adoption of and use of early warning system will, of course, vary from schools and districts because the real incentive is just that this information is available to them if they need it. There's not, there's not so much of a mandate. Okay, you can go on to the next one. Okay, the other example I've seen are programmatic mandates. Um, this strategy I specifically saw used in Texas, um, and it is, it, it, I've seen it in a few places as an incentive, but basically how it works is um, a grant or program um, requires reporting or monitoring that's aligned with early warning system indicators. So, for example, if you had a summer bridge program, which is the example um, in Texas, if you had a summer bridge program, part of the reporting requirement was throughout ninth grade, they wanted to see information about early warning system indicators related to attendance and course performance, as well as GPA and credits earned on these students um, at least two times given in the ninth grade year. Um, and so basically they, um, they, use that, they use the program to start to engage these um, schools and districts that were participating in the program in this process. Um, and so it was a leverage to, lever to start to do that. And what they found is some, of, not all, but many of the schools and districts started to continue to use this type of information to look at more than just the students participating in the program. In addition, it's important to note that as part of the program, they provided technical assistance and support and tools to these programs if they wanted it. So they could choose to adopt it. They were required to report on the early warning system indicators. Can you move to the next slide, please? The last one um, is a legislative mandate. Um, and in this instance, it might be a misnomer to call it a legislative mandate. It's really, um, there was a legislative mandate to focus um, to hold high schools accountable for their graduation rates in the state of Virginia. Um, and in California, they started holding um, middle schools accountable for their students' high school graduation rates. So what this legislative mandate created was a huge incentive for schools and districts to figure out how, ways in which they could raise their, um, their high school graduation rates. And um, in response to that demand, um, two states, in this case Virginia and California, um, provided, provided some targeted technical assistance and resources and again tools. So you can see how this is building on, on each other. And then also in Virginia, they added a level where they started to require schools that were identified for, losing, um, for potentially losing accreditation in warning, they were calling it, um, to actually report on a quarterly basis um, the early, on early warning system indicators for their students. So there was a real incentive for them to use these tools and these mandates. You can see this is um, a little more, tar you, as I'm moving through these, you get a little more intense, a little more um, forceful in your requirements of the schools um, and districts and participating, but it's a way of starting to engage them. And as a result in Virginia, many of the districts there are using early warning system tools um, and 
and reports even beyond those who are at risk um, of losing accreditation. And in California, we have several districts and schools that are using that data as well. Can you go to the next slide, please? Um, so what are the implementation strategies? Um, first, there's voluntary participation. There's good examples of those in Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Massachusetts. And what they did, they're offering tools and validated indicators, implementation guidance, and professional development. The next slide, please. Um, then there's also the strategy of piloting early warning systems. Again, this occurred in Virginia, California, and in Massachusetts, as well as many other states. Um, and basically what this does is it engages a coalition of the willing, um, a group that are actually interested in this work for a variety of reasons and different incentives. Um, these members tend to be active because they have volunteered to participate in this pilot, and they provide really valuable feedback to start to improve tools and guidance for other schools. Um, and they're, through the pilot, they're offered continuous support. So that's the benefit. It's relatively low cost um, in terms of how it gets rolled out, but it's really bringing together um, people in the field who are using these, this type of information and getting a real um, feedback loop. Can you go to the next slide, please? Um, and then the, another implementation, implementation strategy is to integrate indicators between state, district, and school data systems. Um, this has occurred in Massachusetts, or is occurring in Massachusetts and Louisiana. And basically, the state has validated indicator, indicators at the state level, and then they're trying to bring those together with district and school data systems so that those data can be used in part of the decision-making process when you're identifying students who are at risk. Next slide, please. Um, so what are the state implementation incentives? First, um, Improving graduation rates of priority, um, either at the district or the state level. Um, the incentive also is that entry costs are low to get into this work, uh, for into the early warning system work. Um, and, and it's low in terms of the risk because there's been a lot out there already and the resources, depending on how you de decide to roll it out. Um, reporting can be simplified using an early warning system tool or some kind of tool, and that's a real incentive locally. Um, making the data easily digestible actually um, it likely improves the uptake um, at the school level. And then um, when monitoring a school improvement is linked to the indicators at the school or district level or a program um, is linked to early warning system indicators at the district or school level, this can be a real incentive to start to engage schools. And I should say that so many of those schools are no longer required to do that work, but have continued to do it because they've seen some value in it. Next slide, please. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Jared Knowles. Actually, I'm going to jump in for one second, Jared. This is Mindy again, and Susan, thank, or Dr. Terrio, thank you so much for that presentation. You gave us so much information to think about. I was wondering, and I'll give you a minute to respond to it, because I'm going to present a poll and then ask you to respond to the question, but if you were a new state that was about to engage in this type of work, is there one bit of advice you would give them? Now, I'll give you a second to think about that and um, ask participants if you can respond to the poll that's on the screen. And it asks, what's your level of awareness of early warning systems? So just to take a step back and see where you're at with the using or knowledge of early warning systems. And Susan, as people are responding to that, I'll let you tell us your one bit of advice to state. I mean, I think that a good um, starting point is to look at the implementation pathway that was introduced and make it, and you know get some more information and make a decision about where you want to enter into that implementation pathway. Um, I really think that there are validated indicators that have been used in schools across the country, um, and that could be a good launching point. It's a really low resource way to enter into the conversation. And then thinking mm -hmm. about the way in which you want to incentivize the um, schools and districts participation. Um, you know, the voluntary method of you know, providing tools and guidance and the pilot method um, mm -hmm. are really um, strong approaches. Um, I think the pilot gets 
more of a, you know, kind of is more, creates more communication, not only from the state, between the state and the districts and schools, but between districts and schools. And I think that can be a pretty powerful lever as well. That's great. And I think actually our next couple presenters are really going to exemplify some of those um, words of wisdom that you just shared with us. Uh, to just share, it looks like the majority of our participants today are extremely or moderately aware of early warning systems, and a few are, um, we have that are somewhat or slightly aware. I did see one person go into the not at all aware um, category for a moment, but I guess they popped out um, given that they had been just sat through a good half an hour of a presentation. So I'm glad that you're all here. And if you have questions, if we're making some assumptions about your knowledge, please feel free to post those at the bottom of the screen, and we'll make sure that we respond to those. Um, next, we're very excited to have Jared Knowles joining us from the Wisconsin Department of Public Instruction. Um, for you that might not be aware, Jared Knowles currently serves as a research analyst with Wisconsin Department of Public Instruction. There he has led the design and the deployment of the Wisconsin Drop, Dropout Early Warning System, or DUES, and has worked on numerous policy analysis for the department. He focuses on ways to display these results in ways that are interpretable and actionable by decision makers. He is currently completing his PhD in political science at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And Jared, is that the team that's in the um, Sweet 16? I saw Wisconsin up there. Oh, yeah, we are, for sure. Oh, Badgers, right? <laughs> yep. I'm from Minnesota, so Gophers don't like Badgers. Uh -huh. um, Jared is also a fellow in the Interdisciplinary Training Program in Education Sciences and an IES predoctoral training program in which um, – in the Wisconsin Center for Education Research. So we are super excited to have Jared here. He's given a lot of thought to early warning system validation and is really helping roll out this process throughout the state of Wisconsin. So Jared, I'm going to turn it over to you. Oh, thank you for the warm introduction, and it's really great to get to talk to everyone today. I'm going to talk about uh, the dropout early warning system in Wisconsin, or DUES. And I'm going to give a little bit of background first, then I'm going to step back and talk about why we did do's in the first place, and then kind of talk about some of those implementation strategies uh, and how they played out in Wisconsin that we just heard about. So um, do's is a system that sits on top of the state uh, longitudinal data system here in Wisconsin. So uh, all of the calculations happen at the state education agency, and it provides predictions for students at the start of 6th, 7th, 8th, and ninth grade for all students in those grades. Um, so it's about 225,000 students annually. Um, and we report that through a statewide dashboard system. <coughs> so the scale of dues is quite big. We're making a lot of predictions, and we're pushing out a lot of information back to schools. And we're doing it at, with a lot of schools. So over 1,000 schools in Wisconsin have a student who's in grades 6, 7, 8, or 9. Um, so th we've learned a lot, I think, from this, the breadth of that project. We uh, encourage you, if you're more interested in DUES, to visit the DUES support page or to click on this uh, YouTube video, and you can get a four-minute overview of DUES from the perspective of a user. So you can see how you log in, and you can see a video taking you through a dashboard. And I'll have some screenshots later, but the video really is a great introduction, and it's been a key tool that we've used in rolling out the tool to uh, schools across the state. Um, we decided to start down the path of doing dues because one of our agency's goals became reducing disparities in dropout or in dropout and in graduation rates. And when we looked at our four-year graduation rate, Wisconsin has a fairly high four-year graduation rate, but we have also some of the starkest disparities by economic disadvantage and uh, race and ethnicity. And so our new goal became to reduce the disparities, not to increase the graduation rate in general, but specifically to reduce disparities. And one way we decided would be a key strategy was to start in middle school with a middle school early warning system. So that really provided the sort of substantive focus around the state education agency for why we would go forward with um, developing and rolling out dues. So when we first started thinking about dues, I mocked up this 
little theory of action, and, and I think um, when we present about dues with practitioners, they get a kick out of it. Um, so on the left, I have the state data that schools report up to DPI that goes into producing our risk score under dues. And what we always tell schools is that then they have all this local knowledge about each individual student that they uh, should apply to the student risk identification process before deciding on intervention strategies on, on the right. And so, you know, I present the state data as sort of jumbled um, and kind of emphasize the point that the student risk identification that we provide at the state is really a, a suggestion for further analysis and further investigation as synthesis to, to save folks time, but it's not um, meant to be the actual identification. You have to apply that local knowledge to. And, and that message has been pretty well received by stakeholders, and I think that people generally agree that that's the best way to proceed. So that, I think, has been a useful way to frame the, the state's role. assign students to being on track or off track or at risk or not at risk, we actually give students a score from 0 to 100. 100 represents the chance that they uh, guarantee that they'll graduate in four years, and 0 represents that they they definitely won't graduate in four years. And so we group students into three tiers, high, moderate, and low risk, uh, at the request of our schools. But we want to really focus on um, giving sort of a continuous measure of the risk that a student's at. Um, the other thing that dues is different is that it's not in high school, really. It's, at, it's before students start high school, so ninth graders do have it at the start of their school year. Um, but the, the idea is to move back to being truly an early warning system so that um, middle schools are really taking part in this. Another thing that I think is beneficial from the method that we use is we always report a margin of error to our schools. And we always, uh, in our guide, we emphasize how they can use that margin of error to think about either issues they might have with data quality or um, of students to prioritize to look into in more depth to really emphasize that the, the score is not uh, proscriptive, but rather it it's, should be taken into f account with other factors that they have. And then the, the last thing we do is in addition to the score, we provide low, medium, and high risk categories for um, four what we call malleable factors that led to the student's assignment to um, having that 0 to 100 score. So we focus on attendance, academics, discipline, and mobility. And those are the four things that schools can kind of help with or intervene on. And so we, we tell schools, well, this student is a, a high risk because of academics, or this student is a moderate risk in um, attendance and in discipline. And that gives them a bit more of an idea of where to look next uh, for the data. Um, so I'm going to just get a little technical, and then we'll, we'll talk more broadly about policy. But um, Dr. Thoreau talked a lot about the importance of validating your indicators, and that's where it all started in Wisconsin. So this somewhat um, messy graph is actually our validation process. And this is what we use to determine if we want to roll out our indicator and to communicate to our stakeholders about how accurate our, our system is. So um, all the points on this graph, the gray dots of different uh, shapes, are published research on dropout early warning systems and they're the accuracy of those systems. So the top left represents the, the most accurate possible early warning system, and that da dashed line represents a system that's not any better than a random guess. Each curve represents sort of the predictive power of each model in Wisconsin. So we um, plot each grade's models on this curve and see how it compares to some of the um, more famous um, models in the literature that people might be aware of to help explain how relatively accurate or how much they should trust our system. So you'll see that in grades 7 and 8, we're right on track with the Chicago on track indicator, which is a very successful and, and um, well-documented indicator. Um, but we're providing that prediction two years earlier. So we're as accurate as that system, but we're earlier. In grades 5 and 6, it's much harder to predict. So we see a drop in accuracy in grades 5 and 6. And so uh, we're still above some of the more pub the published ABC checklist indicators of Robert Balfons that were developed in Baltimore. We're still more accurate than those. Um, but we're not as accurate as the Chicago model. So we, we make it very clear to our 
schools that you know we are we believe we're accurate enough for you to use someone in making decisions but you you know there is some level of inaccuracy here and there always will be and and you should you know take that into account when you're deciding how to use the system but being able to have this conversation with practitioners about you know exactly how valid is the model and the method that we're using relative to other models in the in the literature has been a, a really useful way to get across that we do take that internal validation process very seriously. Um, here you can see at a high level the way our system works. And our, our system is a, essentially a, a machine learning uh, program that's built on top of our data warehouse. And so I won't go into all of the gory details, but if you're interested, you can certainly reach out to me outside of the webinar, or there's a lot of documentation on our website about how we uh, do this system. But the key thing that we do is validation is built into the process every time that we run the models for every year. We rebuild the models, we recheck how valid they are, and we make sure that our indicators are still accurate and still meeting the benchmarks that we wanted them to meet. So e each time we do that, we, you, we get another year of students, we rerun the models, we fit them, and we check how accurate they are against uh, cohorts that we didn't fit the models to, and then we score our current students and store those scores back into our data system and push them out. So I think that um, it, it's good to, to think about the validation process as part of the programming of the actual system. So instead of doing it in Excel one time in an ad hoc manner, we have this continuous system that each year our data warehouse gets updated. Each year we revalidate our indicators so that that's a key component of the system. Um, now I'm going to go back to talking about policy and, and about how actually dues gets out into the field and, and what we learned from that process. So we have a voluntary uh, system with dues as well. And to learn whether or not dues would be useful, we conducted a pilot during the uh, end of the 2012-13 school year with 34 schools. And the goal of the pilot was really to say, if we do all this work to generate these indicators and we're identifying students that schools have already identified on their own and they're happy with their own identification process, then the state's role in this isn't meaningful. And so what we we did is we mocked up a, a guide for how to interpret the score. We then made reports for all the students in these 34 schools and we gave principals a roster and we said, here's what you would kind of get if we did this system. Will you um, refer to this and then tell us whether or not we found students that you didn't find and whether or not you think this kind of work would be helpful. Um, the feedback was really positive. And when, because of that, school said, not only do you find students that we didn't find, but also it would save us a bunch of time and we can do uh, focus on being more diagnostic uh, in, with individual students. And so uh, that was enough encouragement to, to say, all right, we're going to roll this thing out statewide and, and for the 13-14 school year. Um, but to do that, we knew we needed to have a lot of communication. And so we built our DPI dues website to have an action guide which tells educators about how to go through and interpret the dues score. We have um, some presentations so that if you're trying to convince your principal or your district to make use of DPI dues system, you have some materials there to be an advocate for it in your own uh, locale. We have a checklist for what you might want to use. Um, or think about when you're getting your team together to do the early warning system work. And we have a way to get questions. And then we link to some national resources about interventions you might want to suggest or be able to use and, and diagnostics that you might want to go into for individual students' um, concerns. So if you have students with discipline issues, here's some recommended things that might work. And we're, that's the part we're really focusing on building out now is the to give schools more ideas about interventions that are at use in Wisconsin and that people seem to recommend. So um, that's really the direction that our development is going now. Um, but the idea is, in general is to be very transparent about how the score is derived, to answer any questions people have so they feel very comfortable with it, and to be very upfront with schools about um, the fact that they, their local knowledge is really critical and perhaps more critical voice in the process of figuring out what to do next with students. Um, we also did a lot of professional development. 
Uh, and this is where, at, when you're the state, one of the things that uh, we've been working on doing here is leveraging dues with many of these professional organizations or many of these coordinators or service providers that our schools and districts are engaged with. So we worked with our regional service network, our Title I uh, service providers, our School Counselors Association, um, School Psychologists Association, all of these, these in, um, groups of professional service uh, people in schools, we met with them and, and gave dues presentations at their conferences and got them excited about dues so they would take it back to their district. Um, we also have a statewide data literacy project called Wise Explore in Wisconsin, and dues is a topic that we uh, focus on in those trainings as, as a reason to get schools to come and participate, and so leveraging that work has been critical to getting dues adopted statewide. Um, and we also um, make uh, training available by training our regional service area staff, and they then offer trainings to school districts in their regions on dues. So dues usage, um, we've seen that uh, WISE Dash, which is the reporting environment for our, the state longitudinal data system, we've seen school districts using it much more now that we have dues rolled out. And almost every district in the state has at least viewed a dues report once. Um, in 2013 and 2014, so that's been a really positive sign considering we have a lot of small school districts um, and we have a lot of large school districts that have competing tools, so we, we feel like we're pretty happy with how dues has been adopt, um, adopted. And um, the other thing that we try to do is continually monitor the usage of dues through our dashboard system to see what areas of the state would need a prompt to maybe reach out and, and say, hey, would you like some dues training? And to make sure that we are able to ask those folks who maybe aren't using dues, hey, what can we do to make dues become more valuable? And we've had some really helpful discussions about improvements to the way we report dues. So I'm going to just show quickly a little tour through the dues reports that schools would see uh, as a way of wrapping up. So this is a screenshot of a student's profile. So within our dashboard system, if you clicked on an individual student in your school, this would pop up for that student. And circled here in red is the um, early warning outcomes. And you can see that the student is high risk and their, their band is actually colored in red, so it immediately pops out. And this is a zoom in of, of what four possible early warning outcome boxes might look like. So you see right there the due score is reported, and then you see that the malleable factors, mobility, discipline, attendance, and assessments, they're all reported there too. So you can see um, some students are moderate in mobility but low in everything else, or the other student is moderate in discipline but low in mobility, high in attendance, and high in assessments. Uh, and so you have that numeric score, the categorical score, and then the categories for those things. But the nice thing about the dashboard is that, student, that uh, schools can then look at the data behind this now. So they can say, okay, here's a student roster, here's all the students in my school, and I can sort them by don't have a due score, high, moderate, low, due score, you got their due score in the margin of error in that roster. So that roster tool is used a lot by principals. But then they can click for an individual student on the attendance tab and see the five-year attendance history of that student or the three-year attendance history of that student. Um, then they can also click on the enrollment to see the mobility pattern of that student, what school they were at last. Well, that's really useful. Uh, and they can also get the assessment history there too. So what have we learned uh, in Wisconsin uh, for rolling this out and what's our state role been? I think the first one, and this was a strong theme of Dr. Thoreau's presentation, was to be transparent about how valid your indicators are and to really make sure that you're explaining the accuracy of them because they're much more likely to be trusted and used. Um, another thing that's been critical here is that we got a lot of different parts of the agency internally at DPI involved in the work. So Title I, Student Prevention and well Services Prevention and Wellness, Special Education, all came together to say how can we use dues within the program goals that we have in our, in our different programs. Then we also found school district and regional leaders who were excited about dues and we worked with them to get their feedback, and then also to provide them with the knowledge and information and tools that they needed to go out and get other people to be interested in dues and to see how they could use dues. 
Um, and they gave us a lot of great ideas that we then share back with the community about, well, this is what we've heard that this school district does with dues, and you might want to try that. Or this other school district told us that they, uh, you know, they do an annual dues review at the beginning of the school year, and then they do their own internal tracking throughout the school year. That's a strategy you, you might want to use in your school. So we try to build that bank of strategies and share them out. Um, the pilot and getting feedback is, is the most uh, critical thing for the continued success of the program. And so we're always working on doing presentations on dues, sharing ideas with dues, and making it easy for schools and districts to give us feedback so that we can continue to improve the process. And they feel like it's not the state just providing something to them, but instead it's a joint project between collaboration between them and the state. And that, I think, is very critical when you consider the limited data that we have at the state to provide these predictions. We really need to rely on the educators in the schools to take that information the last mile and to have any real impact on individual students. So I would just encourage you, if you're interested in the technical side, we have a, a journal article coming out in the Journal of Education Data Mining. And there's a preprint of it available at the link here. And you can reach out to me. If you're interested in the policy and program resources, you can go to dpi.wi.gov slash dues and look at the guides we have for educators and the background material we have on dues there to um, make it easy for schools to take up and use dues. I think that's uh, all I have now. Great. Thank you so much, Jared. Um, if participants are interested in those resources, they could click right on the slide. But also on the bottom of your screen, there's a window open called Resources. And if you're interested in the, some of those resources that Jared just shared with us, you can click on them. And then at the bottom of the window, it says Browse To. And that will take you directly to those resources. Also, people have asked if the slides will be available. Yes, they'll be available both via the website and we'll email them to all participants after today's meeting. And lastly, if you need to log off early, we, um, we're sorry, but please complete the survey. And that's in the link or in the chat box called Comments and Insights. You can just follow that link to the survey. So lots going on. Um, Jared, building on your presentation, we're also excited to have John Gimple with us today, and he is with the Minnesota Department of Education. John is the State Implementation Specialist who collaborates with linked leadership teams to ensure that the work of educators is informed by the implementation frameworks so they can connect student achievement with how well interventions are being implemented. Um, we, in Minnesota, they use an improvement cycle that includes using data to determine um, needs, analyze root causes, select usable interventions, and study ongoing um, performance. And their early warning system, the Minnesota Early um, Indicator and Response System, or MIRS, is really an integral part of that process. So John, we look forward to hearing um, a little bit about what's going on in Minnesota. Thank you, Mindy. I just want to make sure you can hear me because I got disconnected at one point. Yep, I can okay. hear you, and I'm glad you're back. All right. <laughs> it was only brief. But uh, it is great to have an opportunity to share what's happening here in Minnesota. And um, I'll mention we are in transition right now since uh, we had a colleague um, retire here who was a, a state-level champion of our early warning system. And I bring this up um, because it brings to light that while it's important to have that champion um, to keep efforts in focus, we also know um, we want to embed it throughout our agency more at this point, um, so it helps us build our capacity while it broadens you know, the awareness and the use of the data. So I uh, wanted to bring up that point. I also want to mention that I have a colleague online as well, Mary Berry here at MDE, and she's with the Alternative Program, so um, she'll be on hand if questions asked later may need to have another perspective. So uh, this is um, our system here, as was mentioned is the Minnesota Early Indicator and Response System, or MIRS. And at this point, the data um, is displayed for grades 6 and 9 only uh, for the purpose of identification. And our vision, though, is to have uh, more grades, uh, more grade levels uh, added to that and ultimately to provide it in more real time. Um, so, but in addition, uh, the other component here is that we have a, a process in place for schools to follow in order to review more data and implement the supports needed for students. That's the, the big picture. And as the database and process were being created here, um, the intention of the work has always 
um, than what you see here on this slide, you know, raise rates and engage students in school. So now uh, the assumption has always been that schools are continuously working at engaging students and, and making that a part of raising graduation rates. This objective um, just makes that very explicit and really helps focus the work going forward. So we encourage the use of many types of data to inform about how well, keep us informed about how well we are engaging students through instruction and behavior expectations, academic standards and, and programs. Um, and we want to know how all of these things are leading students to graduation. So the MIRS data includes academic and some behavior data, but um, it's the responsibility of the school and district to move beyond that and supplement it with more quality local data. And um, this can be challenging, of course, depending on their capacity level. But I draw your attention to the middle of the graphic where you see fidelity of implementation data. This is not always the term everybody is familiar with. So here in Minnesota, we are actively engaged in um, scaling up our use of the frameworks of implementation science in our work with schools. And this phrase comes from that. And explaining the frameworks works would, could be a whole series of webinars in themselves. So um, here I will just simply state that fidelity is about clearly defining beneficial adult behavior in schools so that coaches can assist them. And then we know how well we are actually doing at the supports we're offering to students. Um, then, and only then, can we really make connections to achievement and then repeat what really works. So we are making a real effort here to include that kind of data when we're working with schools so that they're aware of it at the beginning, they can get started and get better from there. So uh, the main um, MIRS variables that we have uh, are, are listed here. Um, this is what's collected at the state level. and. Um, on this next slide are some of the um, other variables or the groups that are used. Um, and for this purpose, you know, gender and ethnic groups are not deemed um, such a high risk. These are the, the areas that um, we have more control uh, as far as serving and changing. So we uh, also uh, are providing professional development to, to users in the state. And now, um, we, we actually require this training before schools can actually gain access to the system. And for better or for worse, our system is a little more tight as far as access to the system. Um, you can see um, schools designate one staff person um, to receive the training, um, and they are the only ones with access. Now, what they do with that access once they get to their um, buildings is a whole different story, but um, it's an effort. Um, this training is required because it's an effort to create awareness of the process which goes with the system and goes far beyond just running a report. So we want uh, to really build that awareness and make sure people are aware of the implementation process. So as stated before, this process includes um, analyzing local data and um, it brings the schools into looking at root cause analysis and then from there selecting a solution. So we're trying to, trying to build that uh, into the system, into the training so that um, schools are, are aware of that. And um, you can see there it's, it's updated um, one time a year with the um, October 1 child count. And it takes some time to get that, um, that data cleaned and ready, and so around February 1st is really when uh, the, the system is updated. So this is a look at the MIRS Secure Report. This is, it's, it's actually just one page. This is the top half of it. Um, and then there's a spreadsheet that goes along with it that shows the uh, student level data and breaks it down. Um, so you can compare that to the charts. But this display, um, it's important to note here that there is no uh, district data here, you can see that the district and the school are the same amount. Um, so this is the middle school, so clearly there are other schools in this district, um, but the district data 
you know, it's just coming out the same because it, it's not reported on here. So if we went to the elementary school, it might be at 40% and the district would also show at 40%. So that's just important to note. Um, there is a, a number of students identified and a number uh, deemed at risk. And so the percentage there is the percent of identified students who are at risk. And um, so the, the students, a student who meets risk criteria in those categories or variables we showed you earlier with the reading, math, attendance, suspensions, expulsions, and multiple enrollments um, is, is who is identified. And then a student who has at least one of the risk factors uh, in a more deeper sentence is, in, in, is an increased risk of, of uh, not graduating in four years. So if they have one or more of those factors that's, that, that is an increased risk, that's when they are labeled at risk in this system. And so it's broken down a little bit more according to the variables here on the bottom half of the page. Um, again, the percentages are, are percent of identified students who are at risk. So you see like in this example that 100% of identified migrant students are at risk. Or if you look at the data, you may not be able to see it real well on there, but there's only one student who's actually identified with that factor. But since that one student is also at risk, it shows at 100% on this, on this um, display. Um, so there is some knowledge that is needed to really understand what this display is showing. It's just it's not as um, intuitive as, as you might want. And that is something that our, our working group is looking at to see how else do we want to actually display this. Um, how is this going to look going forward? And again, yeah. So the, the also, uh, the, all the different variables are, are indicated on the bottom, bottom so that people can understand. Um, if they have a, one of those factors uh, and it's at risk, they know what, um, how those are, are defined. So that's, the, um, that's our syst uh, system and that's just the report there and then they um, will take that and use it within this system that is displayed here on, on this slide. I think Mindy was going to say a few words about this. Is that right, Mindy? I, or do you... Yeah, sure, I can jump in. Um, it's actually great to have um, you here, John, and it's interesting to kind of, given the circular graph, to use that. Uh, it, to bring it full circle, I recall back in about 2005, um, Susan Terrio and I were working together for the National High School Center here at AIR and um, had the opportunity to work with Minnesota and really look to Minnesota for some of the work you were doing for dropout prevention and tiered supports through the high school graduation initiative work. And it was through that process and working with you at simultaneously or parallel to when the National High School Center was starting to look at early warning system tool kind of development and implementation processes. We mm -hmm. just gained a lot of insight from that work in working with the state and your districts and schools and kind of turned it around to develop a seven-step process through the National High School Center. And now it's really uh, fun to kind of see Minnesota take that process and adapt it and make it their own and make it um, applicable for your context. So I'm really excited to hear what you, um, how that's gone and what you've learned from that, John. Yeah, thanks. Um, and this is really great as opposed to uh, a linear list of steps um, connecting it. It really goes along with the science of implementation. We, we talk about improvement cycles and feedback loops and continuously coming back with evaluation and feedback to, to feed how we start that cycle again. So this is a, a great way to, to think about um, the system, uh, however people decide to make this cycle or how long it is. Uh, it's really important to get back to the beginning. Um, All right. I, Go ahead. I, I would be really interested to know a little bit, and we're also joined um, at this point in time by um, Timothy Convoy. Can you advance the slides? There we go. Um, Tim Timothy um, Convoy at this time. And Timothy is with Rosemont High School in Minnesota and has been an assistant principal there since 1997. He provides leadership for special education and work experience programs. In addition, he is in charge of discipline, truancy, 
school safety, credit recovery, targeted services, and all initiatives associated with the school's graduation rate. Sounds like you've got all the good programs under you. So um, I'm excited to hear a little bit about how these processes or these implementation um, processes are being implemented both at the state and school level. So first I just wanted to know, um, I think that a real foundation to this work, and I heard um, you talk about it, I also heard Jared talk about it, is getting stakeholder feedback at the state level, but also at the school level, having a team that works with these data is important. Do you, either of you want to talk about that? Yeah, I could say a couple things. Um, yeah, de definitely a team is important, and uh, we we ask uh, schools to be really um, intentional about the team and and making sure you know it doesn't even have to be a new team, but uh, it could be a leadership team that already exists. That you know, we want people to align things as much as possible. Um, to talk about what the purpose of the team will be and and who the key players are, uh, it's really mm -hmm. essential. Um, and then that team could, you know, move into the, the second step, which is providing the orientation for, for schools. You know, uh, there is at least one person being trained, but a lot of times they actually bring the whole team to the training together so that they can go back and then share it with the rest of the, to the school so that um, they know how to go beyond just running that MIRS report and understanding it, but then going on to the, the other steps of four through seven and continuing that cycle. And we can mm -hmm. let Tim talk about those other steps. That sounds great, yeah. So it sounds, you talked a little bit about that orientation and those mirrors reports. And Tim, I'm going to just ask you if you can talk a little bit about how you do that, reviewing and interpreting the, the data, and then that digging deeper. What does that look like in the school level based off that state data? OK, well, thank you. Um, First of all, I have to say that we really appreciate the report that we get because it saves us a lot of time and also makes us aware of some students that might not be on our radar until after they've um, gone down a path of not earning credits and that type of thing. So we, we also really appreciate uh, the state's uh, role in providing high quality uh, training uh, for the people that are involved in this work. And you did make a comment, too, that, that we're not creating a new process because I think at the high school level, every high school has a student assistance team. And so this, uh, the task of the MIRS data has just become one of the uh, elements under that umbrella. And I'm pretty sure every high school um, has has that structure already in place. We're not creating anything new. But when we get our list, in fact, I just got it this morning for the current freshmen. But last year when we got our list of freshmen, what we did is we took a look at the information the state used to identify the students. Then we went through and we determined what the student's current GPA is. Most importantly, um, whether they were earning credits. And, and again, in high school, graduation is about earning credits and required classes and that type of thing, as well as elective credits. So we took take a look at that. Then we do run reports on their absences, whether or not they've been tardy. Uh, we ask whether or not they've had a 504 or health plan. And I know the state questions whether or not they've been in special ed, but we also look um, at whether or not there was once a question of them being in special ed because as you know many students that um, you know many students that are referred for special ed do not qualify so we just wanted to see if in fact students that might have been tested might end up on this list and then we look at um, at whether or not there's been some discipline uh, in terms of suspensions um, removal from class and that type of thing so we do dig deeper in that regard. And then what we do is we do some analysis as to um, this student's level of risk. For example, um, when we got our MIRS report last year, um, we found that about 85% of the students that were sent to us by MDE um, had um, at one time experienced some failure. Now, maybe they ended up passing the course, but they were on an F list at some point. So the data that we're getting from MDE is pretty good. Um, that said, not all of the kids, uh, for whatever reason, um, are at risk. And we put them in a, 
in a low risk category. And then at the other end of the extreme, the students that are having multiple failures go into what we call a high risk category. And for those students, we work very hard to make sure that they're always um, you know, at the forefront of our meetings and making sure that we're continually monitoring their progress and making sure that they're uh, maintaining an, you know, an accurate um, level of, of progress so that they're going to graduate on time. And if not, then we, like every other high school, we all have programs and initiatives to try to help students that are struggling. And we start to go down this path of trying to find the right services and programs uh, for these students. That um, sounds like a really great, you know, way of kind of transforming from the state level to this local level, drawing on data from multiple sources. And I actually saw the conversation about that also in the chat box, which you probably haven't been following since you were um, speaking. But using these both these state level data and integrating it with the local level data, um, none of this I don't think matters unless we actually make the data actionable and turn it to interventions. Do you want to talk a little bit about how that works in your school, how we go from that state level actually to interventions with those students? I sure do. First of all, once we get um, a MIRS report, for example, we get the report for a group that's in ninth grade, that becomes a cohort, then that data uh, becomes a clearinghouse for um, that grade level all the way up. And what I mean by that is um, the state identifies the students um, and we get the data in ninth grade. However, there are others that, uh, for whatever reason, will end up uh, failing uh, some courses. And also, we'll have students that move in. And so we make sure that those names then get added to this um, existing list of MIRS students. And for example, I think our list roughly from the state was roughly around 100. We've added 15 names uh, to the group that's currently sophomores now uh, because we had some move-ins last summer. We also had some students that, again, who weren't previously identified um, had experienced some failures. We just want to make sure that we, had, we weren't having multiple lists of kids. We wanted to have it all in one uh, place. So it, again, becomes kind of a clearinghouse for students that um, may be at risk for, for graduation. And again, that includes the MIRS identified students and the ones that we've identified. Then what we do, as I stated earlier, we, we, we kind of give them a risk, um, a level of risk. That, and uh, I think somebody else, I think somebody else talked about this already. But uh, the students that are most at risk, um, we bring uh, to a, a meeting to our meeting, our SAT meeting, um, at least quarterly. Um, but we also do weekly um, lists of students with our school technology of students that are failing. And so if one of those students um, ends up failing, um, one of our secretaries identifies it, and we bring that to the weekly meeting. And so that name is put out there for a counselor intervention or some other type of intervention. And these interventions could include um, <clears throat> a, a, re, a special reading class and a special numeracy class to help them with reading and math accordingly. Uh, we have a mentor program that was recently started by our head principal. And for our students most at risk, they're assigned a mentor. Uh, we also have a program called Freshman Academy. Um, unfortunately, this occurs prior to um, us getting the MIRS data, but we do um, have ongoing relationships between the teachers that teach the Freshman Academy. They follow this group of kids um, actually all through uh, the last day that they're in high school. They follow them for four years. And then we do have extended day uh, programs and a program called FLIP, which is Freshman Learning and Intervention Program. And that's designed for any student that in real time is failing a, a, a class, um, either a counselor or somebody from the administrative team. Uh, calls them down at the two-week mark into the next, um, into the into the trimester, and says, "Hey, we have programs here for you after school." We call the parent, get the parent on board, and we've had great success in having uh, students attend that. Um, our district is pretty resource-rich, and we do have um, counselors that come in uh, that provide, 
you know, more in-depth counseling than what a typical um, high school guidance counselor has the time to do. We offer that two days a week, as well as a program called WESEP. And that program follows, to some extent, um, a special ed model, only without the paperwork. So it's kind of nice. But basically, uh, students that are, that are in this most at-risk um, uh, grouping um, are pu put into a um, study hall where the uh, teacher then has about six or seven students, and this teacher works with the mainstream teachers, has all of the books, supplies, materials that the mainstream teacher needs or uses, and is able to provide a very, um, a very careful, carefully planned uh, homework experience to make sure that these students aren't falling behind in their required coursework. And so I think right now we have 40 freshmen involved in that program. 41 freshmen involved in that program right now. And that's probably our most successful intervention. Wow, that sounds like a great a great level of support and really nice tiered kind of supports that are available to students depending upon their needs and um, what's going on. And this is a great story to see from the state level, kind of really high 30,000 feet all the way down to the ground on how these data are used. Um, I'm going to just turn now to starting to um, respond, or I'm going to ask, they're going to respond to some of the questions that are posed, although there's been wonderful conversation going on in the comment and insight and questions box at the bottom of your screen. Um, but panelists, one person, um, and panelists, I mean all four of you, asked, how do schools really make Space for these data. There's a lot of initiatives going on. There's lots of interventions being done. Teachers are really burdened by kind of all of the multiple demands. Administrators have those same multiple demands. How do they make space for early warning systems, especially in the cases like you, um, Susan, Terrio, you d discussed that this is something that's voluntary. Who would like yeah. to respond to that? Uh, I think Jared probably has something to add, too, but this is Susan. Um, first, I would say that um, typically when the state's providing um, validated indicators to the schools, they are primarily um, providing that data one time, maybe two times per year, though I don't think I've seen one that's um, providing it two times per year. So those data give you give schools a, a hint of what's going on with students as they enter the school, as they enter the school, potentially in the fall. Um, but in order to continue to monitor those students, you really need to combine those with local data to monitor you know, their risk over the course of the school year. We highly recommend monitoring over time. So I think that the state data gives you is really just a snapshot and gives you a point in time. And then, um, and then you're able to kind of use that information to hone in on who you need to focus on right away and then continue to use local data to monitor those students. That's great. Jared, John, Tim, do you have any other suggestions on how schools can make kind of space for this activity of using early warning system data? Yeah, this is Tim, and I'll comment on that too. And my answer would be very similar to the previous one. Um, first of all, I, I, like I said earlier, every school has some kind of structure already in place to help manage this. And it just isn't, it's a tool that makes, um, makes our work easier. So I. So I think it actually, I don't see it as a burden at all. I see it as just the opposite. And then, um, like was also stated, there's uh, out of the list of names that um, are received, many of those students w um, will really need uh, no interventions, um, while others will need significant interventions. And I think it's just a matter of um, keeping things you know, somewhat organized. And I don't see this really as a burden at the teacher level at all. Um, I think it's managed. It should be managed by administration, and um, it's if you use the the state data and then pull, uh, add your additional data to it, it's really it's really not that difficult to do. I agree. I've seen a lot of schools actually say just what you said that the efficiencies that this has gained them far outweigh kind of the burden of using the data. 
Um, unless, unless there's other comments to that, I have another question and changing gears a little bit about data access. And this question was, who do you give data to? And um, so how do you open up these data? With whom? Are there any of these data that are kind of publicly available? And then the flip side is, how do you kind of guarantee the privacy and ensuring that? I'll start with a comment about that. You know, because our, our right. system is a little tighter than, than others might be. Um, we're, we have a lot of concern over uh, data privacy for students, so we want to make sure that it is fairly controlled so one person from each school is able to, to actually uh, be given access, and that comes from the superintendent um, has to sign off on that, um, and that they're trained before they actually get access. So we're, we're really trying to make people aware of how important this data is, and um, I don't know the answer to the question of how, if any of it is public. As far as I know, it's not. I don't remember it ever being um, uh, in the in the public eye in reports or anything. So um, at this point, it's just been uh, used at a student level in schools. Great. Thank you, John. Jared, do you have anything additional to add to that? Uh, yeah. In Wisconsin, we kind of take the flip approach of of John and Minnesota in that we have one person designated to be in charge of data access to our dashboard broadly within the district, but they can designate as many people as they want within their district. And we give them some guidelines about what they might want to consider when allowing people access. But other than that, it's, it's entirely up to district staff to determine who has access to what and, and for how long and at what level of detail. Um, it's, we kind of take that local control um, thing and say, yeah, local control also means locally determining who has access to your data because it really is uh, is the district's data. Um, and so one of the thing, one of the strategies we use when rolling out dues is by presenting to multiple different stakeholders. We talk to them about how they can find out who to ask in their district for access to the data and how to. Um, make the case to them that they need access to that data to do their work more effectively. And so because we have that system set up, that gives us a way to get multiple users engaged to say to their administration, oh, I, you know, the counseling team, we need access to dues data so that we can provide better counseling services to these students. Great. Um, and a related kind of question, but this one isn't about actually data access, but more maybe about data use. And here the question is about getting people at the district, so administrators or educators, to really own these data or to buy into the early warning system um, data usage and implementation. And I thought it was interesting, John, you referred to somebody as a champion. And I, too, um, think of that terminology that often some of my most successful implementers have had a data champion, an early warning system champion, as one of the buy-ins. But how do you get that champion, or how do you get that team of champions to really use these data? Um, this is Susan Terrio. Um, I, you know, in my in my observation, um, I was thinking of champion in a little bit of a different way. I really do think that the pilot strategy of um, bringing together that coalition of the willing is a super powerful opportunity. Um, it's a powerful in that you have, you know, you get important feedback, as Jared mentioned in his um, in his presentation. But it's also really important because. Um, if you get a diverse group, they, they talk to other superintendents and districts and can demonstrate the power of it and what, you know, how they've used these data to change outcomes for students. That story, um, and when it's lo a local story, can be really influential. And I really think that's one um, important way of um, kind of bringing on and encouraging more schools and districts to do the work. Yeah, I would agree with that. that and at the state level, we can be really helpful in trying to spread that story um, to other districts. Yes, wow. I, I, agree, I agree with that in Wisconsin, too. I mean, it, it's one thing for DPI to say this thing that we created is really important and you should use it, but it's way more important to say, you know, your neighboring school district uses it, and you should ask them how they feel about it and what they do, and that mm -hmm. carries a lot more weight. It does I, seem I guess from the um, – oh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, no. Go ahead. 
Okay, I would say from the building level, I would I would I look at it a little bit differently. I look at it uh, like this: here's a list of students who may be at risk for something, and if I intervene or I provide leadership for intervention, they they may have a successful outcome versus me not using this data and, or just or, or being aware of it and then not doing anything with it. To me, that's I mean, I should be fired for that because here I have a tool at my disposal that might uh, make it so that we have a much higher um, percentage of students graduating. But at the student level, I mean, how would you like to look that parent in the face and say, well, you know what? When your kid was in ninth grade, I could have done something to intervene, and I just didn't do it. I threw my list away or shredded it. And so to me, it gets back to the, you know, to it's a student issue. I mean, we, all of us, promise in all of our, um, you know, our <clears throat> what we guarantee to the public that we're going to do our best to educate them to their full potential and that type of thing. Well, how can we possibly do that and then not use data that's right in our hands to make our job easier? I couldn't agree more. And I think that really brings home the point that early warning system implementation is really a school level activity. And I think this webinar really brought home the point that it can be greatly enhanced by the state's engagement and support. And I think we really had some great examples in which ways states can support the school level implementation. So I really want to give um, a shout out to all of our presenters. I think they did a wonderful job at illustrating this and providing us with wonderful examples and just a ton of information to think about. The conversation has also been really nice. I've enjoyed the chat and kind of digging deeper. I hope that for most of us this is the beginning, not the end of the conversation. So thank you so much. I also want to point to um, you that there is a survey. We would love for you to complete the survey. Just click the link in the questions or the comments and insight box. Your feedback is incredibly appreciated and helps guide our work and our continued um, endeavors on this and related topics. So thank you all so much for coming today and engaging with us on, the, on this such important topic. Emily, would you like to say anything before we? Uh, we're just, again, very grateful for you. And I've included my information as well as the RHEL Midwest website. And we point you to those resources as well as our Twitter feed to learn more about our work uh, and would love to be in touch in further conversations around early warning systems. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.